Yeah. So I, I think it's a little bit similar in every situation with the exercise prescription, whether it's preventing heart disease or rehabilitation after that it doesn't really fit in how the healthcare works. They have usually they are usually prescribing medicine, they are prescribing it or moving to next doctor or surgery mm-hmm. or so on. How do you see we could prescribe exercise as medicine better in in general and also in, in cancer settings? Oh, oh boy, if I knew the answer to that. Um, so I have some ideas, but, um, but what I really want to do in answering your question is to outline the, the, um, the massive divide that exists between what the experts who are in cancer rehabilitation and exercise oncology, uh, see as like are in pretty massive agreement about what needs to happen. Mm. Um, as opposed to the reality of the clinic. Mm. Okay. So I'm, I've been having these conversations a lot. So I am on the ed- the education and the standards committee mm. for the national accreditation program for breast centers in the United States. Okay. And so I have been advocating for trying to figure out how to get exercise prescribed for breast mm. cancer patients. Right. Um, but obviously I need to do so in a way that is appropriate based on um, the reality of what's happening in the um, clinics that are NAPBC accredited, right? Mm. And what I have learned in the, in that process, and I've you know I've read I don't know how many you know hundred or so different um, uh, uh, submissions from these centers to show what kind of quality improvement initiatives they do that have helped me to understand what the barriers are to making any change of any kind, not just exercise, but, you know, time to treatment, you know, uh, getting women results from their mammograms, you know, all of the things that breast centers do. One of the things that is very clear to me is that there is no one in the clinical setting who can do this. Mm. There is no one. So how would you go about the process of discerning who needs exercise, who needs rehabilitation, where they should be sent. There needs to be an easy button, right? Mm. So I'm really, really um, present to the challenges of the clinic. I think that in in U.S. healthcare, anyway, Mm. I'm I'm speaking about the U.S. here, okay? But I I find it difficult to believe that it's so terribly different in, in other places. I think that um, there's, there's kind of a headless chicken style to what happens in clinics that people are, you know, shoveling people from, you know, like one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Mm. And there is, you know, you interrupt that flow at your peril, right? So there's a mm. clinic flow. They walk in the door, they go here, they go here, they sit down, they go there, they see this person, this next person comes in, you know, like there's a flow to things, right? And mm. changing that flow is, um, really like you have to take a jackhammer to things. It's, it's really cement. It's really mm. cement. Right. So, so that's one side of things. The other side of things is that, um, the, um, uh, rehabilitation physicians, uh, physical therapists, exercise oncology professionals are all exceedingly clear about the need for a, a, a multi-tiered triage process whereby every single patient would undergo some kind of evaluation that would help us to discern this person needs to be seen by a physician, a rehabilitation physician. This person can go to physical therapy. This person can go to exercise. And it may not be an either or. Mm. In, In many cases, it's a both and. So it might be PT and exercise, doctor and exercise, whatever. Okay. It might be multiple things at the same time. Right. Mm. But there needs to be some kind of evaluation. And most of the papers that I see published and that I have participated in publishing and that I have led in some cases have developed these. (laughs) When you think about what I said about the NAPVC, laughably complex algorithms that are like, okay, so we're going to spend an hour doing this and then we're going to spend an hour doing that. And then we're going to spend an hour doing this. 
and then we're going to decide what the person is going to do. Um, maybe not quite that bad, but still, wow, right? Um, and so what I see is this divide between the two. And the question then becomes, well, we really have got to figure out how to make sure that perfect is not be, being allowed to be the enemy of good, right? That um, while we might want to do these very complex triage algorithms and, and we might want to do these evaluations, if the answer is nobody gets anything or we can do a self-report survey that helps us to discern things and buckets people perhaps less than perfectly and then 40 to 50% of patients have actually end up getting something, I vote for that one. I mm. vote for that version, right? So, um, so, so the, the, the way that we are starting, to, this is an area of research. This is an area of active research. And, you know, I'm leading a, a team that is, that is chasing some funding and, um, you know, writing about this and doing pilot work about this. And um, what we know so far is that we need clinician champions. What we know so far is that patients can push this process. If patients come in and insist on things, then, you know, they start to change things. Um, what we know is that standards matter, um, that if it's in the standards, they'll do it. Um, so things, things like the NAPBC standards or the, in the U.S., it's NAPBC, COC, you know, some of the other uh, standards organizations. Um, so there's, so there's, to, to answer this question, there is a need for research that will, um, take, um, the best of what we know from quality improvements in the oncology clinic with the best of what we would like to see happen from, you know, rehabilitation and, and exercise, um, referrals. And so the recommendation coming out of the ACSM roundtable is for, is this really simplistic idea of oncology clinics adopting the exercises medicine approach, which is to ask about exercise, mm. um, to, or to, to assess, right. To assess the exercise. And that's just a matter of, you know, are you exercising? How many minutes a week are you exercising? You know, it could be as simple as that. Um, advise, which is, you know, the words, literally we can script it for, for the nurses and doctors to say, you know, the American Cancer Society recommends that you are doing, you know, so many minutes a week at this time or whatever, or American College of Sports Medicine. Um, and then here's the real tripwire, refer. Hmm. The problem with that word is that there are many, many, many places in the U.S. and elsewhere where there is no place to make a referral to. Mm. There is um, there is a term in nutrition in um, uh, uh, you know food food access research called a food desert, and a food desert refers to a place where there are not grocery stores where you can get fresh vegetables and whatnot, right? Mm. Well, it turns out we have exercise oncology deserts. <laughs> um, we've started to map where the exercise oncology programs are. And I can tell you that there are six cities on the East Coast of the United States with 40,000 residents or more that do not have any exercise oncology. And there are many, many, many rural places in the, on the East Coast of the U.S. that do not have any exercise oncology programming. So mm. if you happen to be a patient being seen uh, in Johns Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which is a, a rural town, where are they supposed to refer you? Mm. Right? So, you know, and, and the answer to that might really lie in, um, in technology. And so technology might end up being our friend here. So, um, you know, uh, virtual programming uh, might end up being helpful, but, uh, I can tell you that the NAPBC is uncomfortable with the idea of referring people to a virtual program that, um, you know, if I'm, you know, Dr. Jones in Johnstown, uh, Pennsylvania, and you tell me I need to refer people to a virtual program that is led by somebody in Ohio that I've never met, and I don't mm. know their training. Mm. 
how do you feel about that? Right? Mm. Yeah. It's difficult. It's difficult. So in order for exercise oncology to be ubiquitous, to be standard of care, we need to have exercise oncology options everywhere. Mm. Everywhere. So the work developing the workforce and developing the programming it are two other of the um, agenda items for the Moving Through Cancer Initiative. Mm. Let's go in a moment back to those. I want to go to the clinic flow, which was interesting word you said that how difficult it is to change the clinic flow. And I, I think that's an important part also for the general exercise prescription. <laughs> do, do, yeah. do you have any any examples of the clinic flow that we have changed in a history successfully and what has it demanded, for example, have we brought physiotherapy at some point? Or I, I don't know what have the changes been, but when is the last time the clinic flow has changed considerably in how it was done? Right. So um, there are um, two or more, but two, in my mind, shining, shining examples of um, uh, healthcare systems in the United States that have um, really adopted the exercise as medicine, um, you know, ask, advice, refer approach. Um, one of them is Intermountain Health in Utah. Mm. Um, and the leader there is, is uh, Dr. Liz Joy, Elizabeth Joy. And um, the other uh, health system is um, Prisma Health, um, which is associated with um, University of South Carolina Greenville School of Medicine. And the leader there for this is Dr. Jennifer Trilk. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, EIM Greenville approach is, um, I think, the most um, extensive and close system. And so um, what they have been able to do in a number of the clinics, so sort of subsets of, of, that, of that health system, is um, they have um, uh, incorporated the physical activity vital sign. So, you know, you go to the doctor and they take your blood pressure. They take your temperature and they weigh you. These are all vital vital signs, right? Mm. So concept is let's add physical activity as a vital sign, right? Mm. So they've added physical activity as a vital sign to the electronic medical record. So anybody who gets roomed, you know, who arrives at the doctor, checks in, sits down, they call them back, they do their vitals. That's getting roomed. That person is getting roomed and they get asked about physical activity. If their physical activity is less than the guidelines, then uh, there is advice that is given by the clinician and then they are referred. They're, there's an automatic referral that goes to two staff people who then call that person and say, hi, my name is, I don't remember their names, mm. and you know, I'm from the Exercises Medicine program and your doctor has referred you to this program. Can we you know, get you started with an evaluation? And they have then made a partnership with the YMCA in Greenville and um, the YMCA staff um, do the evaluations and deliver a 12-week program um, that is, uh, you know, like, you have to think about it for a second. It's, you know, the devil's in the details, you know. Nope, you can't come if you have, you know, um, advanced uh, heart failure. Nope, you can't come if you have, uh, you know, certain other conditions that would mm -hmm. make it impossible for the why to be able to really be helpful to this person. Mm. So those people need to be sent someplace else, um, maybe to physical therapy. Um, so, um, so they've got this system all worked out. And um, if, you know, every, I mean, I, I work with Dr. Trill on, on a project and, and, you know, and I've, and I've sort of peeked behind the curtain, if you will, to look at how, um, uh, you know, how this works and, it is quite the infrastructure. It is not just, you know, ask, advice, refer. I mean, there's, <laughs> that's, that makes it sound like what could be difficult about this, you know. Mm. Um, the referral piece, there has to be a, a program to make the referral to, right? So she had to develop that relationship with the YMCA, and there has to be follow-up, and then there's follow-up with the doctors to say, your patient did the program, and this is what's going on with them. Um, you know, there has to be um, a way to deal with people if they have some sort of worsening of their condition while while they're dealing with the while they're doing the program. There's there's a a, a lot of of aspects here that have to be um, uh, um, pulled together, right? 
But when we then sit down again, I just want to contrast that when we sit down with oncology clinics and say, we'd like to do this exercises medicine Greenville approach in your clinic, they look at us like, you know, we have lobsters crawling out of our ears. You know, there's no way Mm -hmm. that they're going to make those kinds of wholesale changes for exercise. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that's where it's interesting because, you know, we were invited in the door because they believed in exercise, but when it comes down to actually changing their clinical practice for exercise, they'll fascinatingly, they'll change it for nutrition. But they won't mm. change it for exercise. Why? Why do you think that this? What's the What's the difference? I wish I knew. I really, I wish I knew. I think, I think that there is a misperception that we know more about nutrition than we do, and that we know less about exercise than we do. Mm. The other difference, the other difference, and this is crucial, is that we have to eat. Right. Mm. So your patients are going to deal with nutrition, whether you're telling them anything about nutrition or not, Mm. but you don't actually have to exercise. Yeah, that's true. And how do you see, do you think you said that maybe there's an illusion that we know more about nutrition than physical activity? Do you think it's enough to ask the patients that do you exercise? How much do you exercise? Or would it be better that it would be measure it accurately like for example you get the blood test you get objective results mm-hmm. you can see is it there where it should be do you think this kind of thing could help to take it more seriously if we if we make it more like science also in mm-hmm. clinical setting um i think that that was an approach that was tried and i think that it was it the barriers to getting patients to um, undertake those tests um, were considerable. And so I think that the recommendation is, I mean, I don't, I don't think that um, I'm saying that we shouldn't test. I think that what I'm saying is that to get the patient to the program where the testing would happen, let's do just a simple ask. Mm -hmm. Let's assess their physical activity. And if they're less than adequately physically active, get them into a program and then we can test them. Then we can do whatever testing we want to try to do. Then, yes, I agree, doing testing, but we're not going to get testing on everybody. Mm. And when, when you talk about testing, do you mean like, for example, a submaximal ergometer test or, or what kind of testing you you referring to? Um, I actually think um, it is it is my opinion based on um, what, you know, everything I know about what clinicians care about, what predicts mortality, what predicts return to work, um, the, you know, the usefulness of various tests and couple that with wanting the test to match the need in the population. Um, I tend to toward very practical functional tests, six minute walk test, mm. um, the short physical performance battery, stand up and go, timed up and go, um, uh, chair stands, you know, those kinds of tests, um, rather than putting people on um, cycles or, or treadmills. Mm. I'm not saying that putting them on cycles or treadmills is bad. I just think that, um, when I think about the variety of places, you know, I'm interested, I mean, here's the thing. I'm not interested in exercise oncology. I mean, success to me is not exercise oncology happening at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Mm. right? Memorial Sloan Kettering is is like, not like the rest of the world, right? Mm. Dana Farber, Penn, Hopkins, you know, all of the big MD Anderson, you know, I'm interested I keep coming back to it, but I, I'm interested in exercise oncology being standard of care in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Hmm. I'm interested in exercise oncology being, um, uh, you know, standard of care in Altoona. You know, I'm I'm in Pennsylvania, so I'm coming up from Pennsylvania towns, but um, in Schuylkill County, you know, in Tioga County, you know, I'm interested in exercise oncology being standard of care in such a way that if you are seeing an oncologist, I mean. Understand that 80 to 85 percent of cancer patients in the United States are seen in these community settings. They are Mm. not seen 
at the major cancer centers. Mm. There are 44 NCI designated cancer centers in the United States, and they see less than 15% of the cancer patients in the United States. Mm. Now, they see a lot of people, but that's not where the majority of cancer is, is being, cancer care is being delivered. And those settings do not reflect how cancer care is delivered. Mm. And and when you say exercise oncology as a standard of care, could you describe us how then it works? What what is yeah. kind of practically done? I think many of the listeners don't don't in have my an dream idea. world. <laughs> um, yeah. So in my dream world, we um, it is uh, there is a physical activity vital sign. So we are asking about physical activity as we're moving, rooming patients. It's just like we're asking for, you know, we're taking their temperature and weighing them and all that. Um, uh, we are reminding them of the guidelines um, if they are not meeting the guidelines um, uh, so that a healthcare professional actually has words coming out of their mouths. <laughs> you know, it's actually like there's a script that says, you know, in the same way that if your if your temperature is elevated, you go, oh, your temperature is elevated. You know, this would just be, oh, you know, did you know that exercise is recommended during your treatment? Um, you know, uh, so, so that's, the, and then there should be within the electronic medical record, uh, tripwire that, you know, if somebody is doing less than the recommendations for physical activity, there should be an automated email to the exercise oncology group. Um, and by the way, we have this at my institution. Mm. So there is an automated email to the exercise oncology group that says this person could use a consult. And then the staff from that group can call that patient and say, hi, I am from the, in our case, it's called the one group, oncology, nutrition, and exercise. I'm from the one group. Um, your doctor has noted that you are less than physically active and we would like, you know, to offer you this exercise program. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there is a space within the clinic. We have that space at Penn State um, uh, where you can meet the patient the next time they come in for their treatment and do an assessment and set up a program for them. And, you know, largely it's going to be a home-based program. They're going to do their exercise on their own, right? Unless, mm. unless they really shouldn't be, in which case you might be sending them to physical therapy, right? Mm. Um, and, but there is a, a referral, there's a program, there's a follow-up. And 12 weeks later, we do the assessments again to see whether or not we're at least holding steady, if not uh, improving things as they're going through the treatment. So. Mm. Um, same thing needs to happen in the survivorship clinic. Mm. Exact same thing needs to happen in the survivorship clinic. Yeah, yeah, I- interesting. Uh, we have seven minutes left, and I haven't really asked most of my questions, but that's <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But maybe we go go as a, as a highlight feature in a way that could you explain our listeners how come people should exercise during a really really demanding cancer treatments and maybe what are the mechanisms why why they really help so maybe maybe a highlight way of of simplifying things yes okay all right so um so yeah this is a great great question and um and i address this um a lot in in my popular press book called moving through cancer and um because you know it really is it does feel a little bit mean you know um somebody is going through the process of of uh of their cancer treatments and i'm saying hey i want you to do this other hard thing while you're doing this hard thing of going through your cancer treatment so why why am i mean why why do i want to want to ask people to do something that's hard while they're going through something hard Mm. and um and the answer is um you know first an acknowledgement that it's hard absolutely what they're going through is hard and Uh, so there's no there's no question about that. But um, what I also know is that we can predict with tremendous accuracy that people who go through their cancer treatment, who do not exercise while they're going through their cancer treatment, are going to lose muscle mass. They're going to lose function. They're going to gain fat. They're going to be more fatigued. They're going to have worse symptoms in response to their treatment. So there are trade-offs here. Mm. And if you choose to have more symptoms, more fatigue, and lose, you know, function and muscle mass, then at the end of having gone through this thing that it was very hard, you then have another thing that's very hard. You will have aged. 
you will have aged not chronologically, but biologically. Mm. It has been published that women who have gone through breast cancer treatments are about 10 years older in terms of their function and fitness than women who have not gone through breast cancer. And so we know that people feel like they aged a decade during that year of treatment. That mm. happens. That is documented over and over and over again. And so the question is, do you want to deal with this and prevent some of that while you're going through your treatment? Or do you want to wait and deal with it after you're done with the treatment? Mm. And some, you know what? I get it. Some people may say, I would prefer to wait until after I'm done with my treatment. Um, it is, you know, for some people, a, a very short period of time, in which case, okay, you know, more power to you. But if you're going to be doing treatment for a year or more, then you're going to lose a lot of muscle mass and a lot of function. So, and what are the mechanisms? So the mechanisms, it depends a bit on um, which of the outcomes we're interested in. We know that exercise during and after cancer treatment can help with anxiety and depression. We know that it can help with physical function, which is to say your ability to do the things that you need to do to carry out your day, carrying things, climbing stairs, running, jogging, walking fast, um, getting to and fro, getting out of chairs. Um, sleep is improved. Bone health is improved. Breast cancer related lymphedema is improved and quality of life is improved as well. Um, and I feel like I'm forgetting one. It's like naming the dwarves. You always forget one. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, the, the mechanisms of oh, fatigue, I don't know if I said fatigue. So fatigue, one of the, one of the reasons why fatigue is improved is because we know that exercise alters, uh, the body's level of circulating cytokines. And, hmm. um, it is thought, um, though research is still ongoing that one of the mechanisms by which, um, uh, uh, we, we moderate, uh, the level of cancer related fatigue is through moderating, um, cytokines, circulating cytokines. And so exercise should be helpful with its inflammation. So cytokines are a form of inflammation. So that's, uh, that's, that's one of the things. The other thing that is crucial is, um, maintaining body composition. So in other words, maintaining your fat and not allowing fat levels to go up and maintaining your, maintaining your muscle mass. Now, it turns out that maybe there is ongoing research right now um, uh, that is uh, testing whether or not maintaining your muscle mass might be important to your ability to tolerate your chemotherapy. Mm. There are uh, lots of theories out there about the possibility that um, by maintaining your muscle mass as you go through uh, chemotherapy, you're better able to tolerate it. That's important for a survival benefit. That's important because if you do not get at least 85% of what was originally prescribed of your chemotherapy, there is a known um, uh, decrease in, uh, in likelihood of survival. So that, that should per perk some ears up. Um, so those are some, some of the mechanisms. Um, uh, the, the thing that I guess I do want to touch on very briefly is that um, the mechanisms by which exercise is likely to prevent cancer from occurring in the first place or prevent cancer from recurring or death from cancer are distinct mm. from these mechanisms for symptoms. Mm. So the uh, mechanisms by which exercise is likely to reduce risk of cancer in the first place probably have more to do with angiogenesis, inflammation, the insulin pathway, body composition, so that one's in common, uh, with the symptoms, um, and changes in the tumor microenvironment, um, likely some hormonal changes that are, that are relevant there as well. Mm. Yeah, this would be really interesting to discuss, but I think we are running out of time. If, if listeners want to learn more, we have also, uh, episodes with doctors, Kieran Fairman and Mary Kennedy related to exercise oncology. So you can refer to those and maybe we get to discuss another time with Catherine because we didn't have time to talk too much about many things but uh, thank you Catherine this was really interesting uh, discussion thank you for inviting me it was a pleasure